And now we were going to have uh, Representative Brayback. Uh, I know, yes, she's on. And she's going to tell us how to get our Dr. Brayback, please let us know how to get rid of this misinformation, how to remain sane, and how to fight back. So take it away, uh, Dr. Brayback. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm happy to be here with all of you today. Uh, and uh, like many of us are doing, you know, kind of in a million different places in our great state, uh, talking to people. So happy to be with you uh, via Zoom. Uh, and Mary is right. And Lavora talked about this and E.G. Nessel talked about this. Uh, there is a, a huge amount of disinformation uh, that is out there pertaining to the election, pertaining to particular candidates. Uh, and we all need to be really, I feel like, hyper aware of that. Uh, and the things that we can do to be able to protect uh, not only ourselves, uh, but people around us from that. And one of the things that was fantastic that I got to participate in was NARAL did a training. And it's a huge disinformation training. And a lot of the information that I'm gonna share with you today uh, came from that disinformation training. Uh, Senator Irwin and I, and hopefully in partnership with WCDP, are gonna try and bring that training to all of you um, because it was just spectacular. And as we're getting ready uh, or you know, like gearing up uh, and having all the plans that we've been making you know, for the past year really come into fruition as we're gearing up to head into this election year, uh, want to really ensure that that is front and center for folks. Uh, and, uh, and so please uh, keep an eye out for that uh, training. But in the meantime, wanted to share some of these tactics uh, with you to try and inoculate all of us from the disinformation that is so widespread. Uh, as uh, Chair Barnes said, it is just relentless uh, and it is persistent uh, and we need to be very, very, very um, uh, aware of and ready to be able to combat that. So basically, you know, when we're talking about disinformation, uh, disinformation is the deliberate intentional falsehood uh, it's not an opinion. Uh, it's it's uh, or you know a myth. It's also um, a myth that can be shared just absolutely erroneously. Uh, and so you know, remembering that that's the basis of this disinformation really helps us. There are some red flags to keep in mind uh, when trying to spot disinformation. Uh, so. You know, I think back to, uh, you know, middle school and high school when I know I was learning from, you know, all of my teachers about critical thinking and, and checking primary sources and uh, doing those kinds of things. We're doing the same thing here uh, with all of this, you know, and so making sure that sources are trustworthy, uh, that we know where those, you know, where the information is coming from, making sure that uh, the evidence is not just anecdotal. You know, when we have just anecdotal evidence um, that a, a great number of uh, things that are uh, filled with disinformation uh, can, you know, fill our, you know, Facebooks, Instagrams, Twitter accounts. Uh, and so really making sure that uh, we look for things that are just anecdotal and really question those. If the claims, which we saw, uh, I feel like, multiple times every day uh, after our presidential election, um, if the claims are wildly exaggerated, again, that is something to be aware of. Uh, this is something that um, I think we hear, we saw and continue to see over and over and over again. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about a little in a little bit here is, um, you know, when things get repeated consistently, people start to believe them uh, as, as truth. Uh, and that is a tactic uh, that Trump has used over and over and over again and has been very successful at. Um, I'm sure we all have had conversations uh, with uh, with acquaintances, uh, maybe even some friends uh, who supported Trump, who believe things that are absolute lies, but they believe them just because they were spouted over and over again. Uh, so that's something that we have to, to be aware of. Uh, the final kind of red flag is that if the information is about a, you know, a group of people um, and the, the, the folks that the information is about aren't part of the conversation, that is also something 
that we need to really question and, and take a look at. And so, you know, we have these red flags that we really need to uh, monitor for ourselves, be aware of, be able to point out, be able to identify, uh, and uh, um, and then be able to, if we can do all those things, if we can identify them, point them out, uh, recognize them, then we're able to really inoculate ourselves from them. Uh, so NARAL pointed out uh, to us when we did the training that there are really four key components to being able to combat disinformation. So I want to share those with you and then uh, talk about some general um, some general uh, things to remember um, about disinformation. Uh, and so the first one is really about that inoculation I just talked about. Like, if we know that disinformation is coming, if we are aware of that um, and kind of our, you know, have our suit of armor on for that, then disinformation is less likely to stick. Uh, and so just the sheer knowledge that, uh, and recognition that that could be coming in helps us. Uh, and so, you know, my hope is that, you know, all of us are well aware uh, of these campaigns that are relentless and continue to happen. Um, and just by that mere fact, we are ahead of the game. Uh, you know, the, the next thing I, I feel like for us to do is to spread that to other people, right? To, to help other folks recognize that, that there is widespread disinformation uh, and to challenge folks to really critically think and to question that information uh, and not just to blindly accept something that they see again on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter uh, as fact. Uh, and so again, just recognizing that helps inoculate us. I was just talking about this uh, you know, just a moment ago but that we need, uh, again, to combat this disinformation uh, that keeps getting spread, we need to repeat and amplify accurate information. And so when we see that there is something that we, we know and can prove is inaccurate and we know is disinformation, we need to do our best to continue to amplify the correct data uh, and uh, get that message out there so that folks can remember um, and at least, at least it will help folks to start to question a little bit, even if they are, you know, still believe that disinformation, we might be able to open that door just to crack to help them start to question that a little bit. Uh, and I feel like all of us can do that in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, whether that's in personal conversations um, or you know, like one of the things that um, is difficult, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, is that the algorithms that are used on social media, if we engage with disinformation, it makes them uh, have a higher rate of, you know, people see them. And A.G. Nestle talked about this, that, you know, we'll, we'll see more about uh, Aaron Rodgers and his not taking the COVID vaccine than all the amazing things that our, you know, three amazing statewide elected officials are doing or any of us in the legislature. Uh, and so um, really being aware of how we're engaging in terms of that uh, amplifying that accurate information. The other thing that we want to try and do when we're able to be out there trying to combat disinformation is trying to meet people where they're at. Uh, and I know that that can be really frustrating uh, when folks seem to believe uh, or do believe things that um, seem, you know, frankly, Im uh, you know, impossible uh, that they believe them. Uh, but being able to uh, really approach those conversations and NARAL um, really, I thought framed it really well when we were talking about this, uh, but trying to approach those conversations with compassion and curiosity. Um, and while that I think in the moment can be extremely challenging and difficult, I think that leaves the door open uh, for continued conversation. And again, just it might just give us that little bit of sunlight to be able to disrupt that disinformation. Uh, and, and so I think that that is, I know that I remember that when I'm trying to talk with folks um, who uh, seem to, to believe something that is completely false or part of the big lie um, that is really helpful. The other thing that can be really helpful and something to use, a tactic to use is just asking questions, you know, like trying to understand what's important to that person who you're talking about, who believes the disinformation, uh, trying to ask them questions so that they can hear out loud uh, 
that their logic isn't making sense. Uh, and, uh, and that sometimes when folks can hear themselves say it out loud, like they get outside of the sometimes circular logic that can happen um, inside uh, their head, um, that can help them start to question themselves. Uh, and so being able to have those kinds of conversations that then, you know, if we're asking those questions, trying to find that angle that might resonate with that person to start to question that disinformation, that can really help start to combat uh, the disinformation that is so rampant right now. Well, there are several kind of general things uh, to remember uh, in terms of disinformation. Um, one, uh, when we're seeing things again on social media or in other places, uh, you know, all of us should be aware of the messenger. You know, what's the source? Where is this coming from? Uh, and trying to keep that context very present for ourselves. And when we're talking to other people, be able to point that out. Uh, and so that messenger, again, where that source is coming from is becomes vital uh, to fight disinformation. Uh, that goes without saying that with disinformation, we all need to do uh, our own research to be able to prove something uh, was uh, incorrect or correct, as the, the case may be. I can remember actually uh, just this week uh, seeing a clip of a video um, you know, of uh, Melania Trump and she uh, like the, it was highlighting that she smirked. And the first thing I thought of is, I wonder how I can check to see if this video is actually accurate. Uh, and so um, being, because it showed, you know, they were trying to, to show her disdain in that moment. Um, for the former president. And, uh, and so being able to do our own research is really important and vital uh, because when we know the information, then we can help spread again, that accurate information to interrupt that disinformation. I spoke about this before, but it's important to remember uh, that when we see disinformation uh, online to just be aware of how we're interacting uh, with it, uh, because again, uh, of the algorithms that are used, we don't want to unintentionally uh, lift up that disinformation so that more people are seeing it. Uh, and so we have to think of other ways to uh, interrupt that disinformation. Uh, one of them is if you know the person uh, who uh, is uh, unfortunately spreading disinformation, I reach out to them privately uh, and to try to ask them some of those questions uh, to see um, why they believe this is true or how they came to believe that this was true or false again, as the case may be, uh, and, uh, and try to have that kind of conversation that again, hopefully will have them open uh, to interrupting the disinformation. The other thing that can be, and again, I'm sure many of us have had this experience when trying to and engaging in that disruption of disinformation, of getting really frustrated uh, when we're talking with folks who seem to believe things that, um, from our perspective, so I need, at least I should speak in I statements from my perspective, um, just seemed completely inane, um, that it can be really hard to remain calm and uh, patient and kind of, you know, as Nayral was saying, like lead with that compassion and curiosity, um, but it can be really trying. And so uh, to really help kind of steal ourselves, uh, you know, for those conversations, you know, going in, uh, trying to be, to do that in a non-confrontational way so that we're able to listen and able to hear and continue to engage to maybe then again get that person to a place uh, where they then them, themselves can question that disinformation uh, is really important. Now this also happens, this happens locally, nas you know, nationally, uh, state level. If there's information um, that's coming from elected officials uh, that is disinformation, um, you know, some of the things NARAL suggests a couple of different things because we know that that happens. I, I've watched my colleagues at the state level do this, um, you know, and we certainly know that it happened on a national level, happens on a national level. Um, you know, some of the things that, that they suggest uh, to combat that first, uh, again, is trying to personally reach out to the, the elected officials office uh, or them themselves uh, to have those conversations uh, to challenge them. Now, I know um, just from personal experience, uh, and like many of you, that this also can be very frustrating, but I think it's also really important that we, you know, the more of us who continue to try and disrupt the disinformation, the harder it is for the person to continue to believe it. Um, you know, and so even if they continue to say it, 
um, there is going to be an incongruence within them uh, that will can, well, that will struggle. And if we can increase that struggle and that discomfort for them, uh, that is helpful in combating that disinformation. Uh, and if that that you feel like once you reach out to that person and are you know that elected official uh, and try to uh, really point these things out and you feel either dismissed or like you're not getting anywhere, um, you know NARAL really suggests then trying to do it publicly. And and one of the things that they say, and I agree with them, uh, is that you know, you know the folks who elect that elected official um, are really, uh, really should be aware of the disinformation that that elected official um, is spreading. Uh, and so NARAL, like I said, does a fantastic job uh, in, in helping us, you know, um, be aware of disinformation. Um, you know, I went into the training, um, I took the training at the beginning of this year, um, you know, I went, went into the training, uh, like I'm sure many of us thinking like, oh, I can spot it. I know it. I, it'll, you know, I have all the tools, it, you know, it, I got this. Um, and for me, I felt like it was really helpful. There's um, always so much more we can learn. And I really found like having additional tools in my tool belt um, to be able to combat this. Um, Cause again, as Chair Barnes said, it is relentless right now. Uh, and so we need all the tools at our disposal, particularly as we're heading in to next year where I can only imagine uh, that that disinformation will ramp up. Uh, and so all of us need to be aware of that uh, and, uh, and really, really try to um, disrupt in all the ways that we can. Like I said, Senator Irwin and I uh, are going to try and coordinate with WCDP to bring the training to you so that, um, you know, folks, if you want to be a part of that uh, and learn some more, can do it. NARAL is doing great work uh, and uh, really offer a service that we can all learn from. Uh, and so that is, um, you know, the Mary, I pre appreciate you asking about that and asking about, you know, how we can disrupt that disinformation. Um, the way that we can, uh, the second part that you wanted me to talk about was how we could all stay grounded <laughs> and how we can, you know, during this time, it is going to be a whirlwind. It is going to be challenging. It is going to be difficult. Uh, we are going to need to bring I feel like our best coping strategies forward <laughs> during uh, this next year. We have so many things happening, right? We have, you know, new lines. Uh, we have, um, you know, again, this incredible rise in disinformation and folks willing to believe it. Uh, and, and so we need to all remember uh, that we need to take care of ourselves. Uh, and so I'm going to ask everyone <laughs> to really practice all of those self-care uh, strategies that you have. Um, and really be aware of that. If we are not doing that, uh, we are not going to be able to give the energy to the election that we all want to, that I know we all want to. Uh, and so please, please be aware of that. I know that we're all busy and sometimes that can go to the back burner, like taking care of ourselves can go to the back burner. Um, but please try to remember that by taking care of yourselves, you are helping all of the campaigns and, and the election that doing that work helps all of us. Uh, and so, um, you know, I just encourage all of us to continue to do that. Um, and then one last plug, Mary, if I have, if I have a couple of minutes, thank you so much. Um, I have the, the, I am very fortunate to be able to be leading the mental health uh, listening tour throughout our state for the Democratic Caucus right now. And uh, what that is, is uh, right now I am in the midst of going to 13 different places throughout our state to talk about our public mental health care system. Uh, there are two bills, uh, one uh, in the House and one in the Senate, um, that uh, the bill in the Senate, uh, I believe it works to privatize community mental health, which would be a nightmare uh, for our communities and for our consumers and their families. Uh, and so um, we, um, the Democratic Caucus, decided to go and talk with people uh, before we created the legislation. The, the reception has been incredible. Um, I just was in uh, Lansing and Saginaw this week. Um, talking with those communities, but I know I've been all over. We've been to Grand Rapids, Marquette, Detroit, uh, Livonia, uh, and so Kalamazoo. Um, and we have the listening session for Washtenaw County on November 15th. So I want to make sure to invite everyone. Uh, we will have a panel of experts 
uh, including consumers and, uh, and then folks from uh, CMH, from the uh, PIHP, which is kind of like the layer uh, above the PIHP between the uh, community mental health organization, our, our agency here and the state. Um, we're gonna have uh, folks from uh, uh, our like providers who we work with in the community uh, and um, folks from physical health as well, both U of M and our federally qualified Packard Health, our federally qualified health center. So please, we want to hear from you. Um, it is gonna be at 5.30 on uh, the 15th, and I believe Morgan, thank you, Morgan, just put info uh, in the chat around that. Uh, so please join us. Uh, what we're hoping, and I'm working on from these this listening tour, uh, is legislation uh, that will be qualitatively different from the legislation that is out there uh, right now, and um, uh, offering that to the caucus to be able to lift up. Uh, and so, Mary, thank you for letting me uh, share that with people. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate and, uh, all of you and look forward to working with all of you uh, through the next, I think, what did Lavora say, 367 days? <laughs> so thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Representative Dr. Brabeck, for that information and how we can interrupt all of this disinformation, misinformation, lies. Let's just say it like that. That's what we need to do.